How many of you are ready for the word this morning? Amen. Amen. Two of you are ready for the word this morning. I'm really glad that you're very enthusiastic. I know it's that Valentine's week, right? It does that to people. You're exhausted and drained. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. So I'm going to be reading out of Matthew chapter 22, verse 34. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees with his reply, they met together to question him again. One of them, an expert in religious law, tried to trap him with this question. Teacher, what is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. A second is equally important, love your neighbor as yourself. That's why I love Shashi and Prema, because they are literally my neighbors. (laughs) The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. You know, today uh, we want to look at some foundational principles in our walk with God. And uh, over this past week, like I said, we celebrated love. There was Valentine's and, uh, you know, there's a whole lot of uh, love floating in the air. Hearts all over Facebook and Instagram and, and you know, heart eyes, you know, blinking at you in photos and so, f- so forth. And uh, the, the, in this portion of scripture, I chose this portion of scripture because there are some very important truths in this scripture. And I just want to focus on two very important words in this statement by Jesus. These words are often overlooked or passed by without much thought. But they are very important for us to understand if we are to walk in obedience to this command from Jesus to love our neighbors as ourselves. In this Jesus moment, the Pharisees are trying to corner Jesus or trap him. Uh, to say something wrong or contradictory to their laws. Uh, so this expert in religious law, also known as lawyers, there was a religious lawyer there, and he asked Jesus this, this question, and uh, what is the most important commandment in the laws of Moses? You must understand, the Pharisees were obsessed with the law, uh, with the laws of Moses uh, when Jesus came into the scene, the whole relationship with God uh, for the people was dictated and governed by laws. They used law, laws to control people, laws to, to kind of run everything, the religious system, their daily lives. And uh, in fact, at the, by the end of the Old Testament, uh, they had 212 laws that they had under the Mosaic Covenant. But after the, the last uh, uh, book, from uh, the book of Malachi, and then we see the first book, the book of Matthew, where Jesus comes onto the scene, there was a period in between that is described as the years of silence. And uh, that is a period of 400 years, and it's called the years of silence because there was no prophet, there was no uh, leader, prominent leader sent by God to lead his people or to, to speak to his people or to teach his people. And, and they were called the years of silence, but uh, they, it, just because they were called the years of silence, it doesn't mean that God was silent. God was preparing and working behind the scenes for the coming of his Savior, his Messiah into the world. So these 400 years, the years of silence. Listen, some of you may be going through a period of silence in your life where you feel you're not hearing from God and it's a season where you know God is not speaking to you. I want you to know just because you feel these are the days of silence or the years of silence, it doesn't mean that God is not at work behind the scene to bring about a great victory and a great salvation for your life. Amen? God is at work. So when Jesus comes into the scene, because of these years of silence, the Pharisees didn't hear, or or the people didn't hear from God or from a prominent leader, they started to interpret the laws by themselves, and they started to add to the laws. And by the time Jesus comes onto the scene, and this is by the the book of Matthew, you know, when when Jesus is born and he comes into the scene, the, the laws had evolved from 200 plus laws, now they had 600 over laws. They had 600 over laws, they brought out different laws, they added to the, to the, the Mosaic Covenant, and, and now the people were not 
living or practicing the Mosaic Covenant, they were living under Judaism. Judaism was what the Mosaic Covenant became when man took over and started to interpret and add and add and add. Now they had laws that subjugated women and all kinds of things they put in place. So when Jesus came into the scene, uh, it wasn't, he wasn't walking into or coming into a time where people were practicing the Mosaic Covenant. They were practicing Judaism. People were oppressed. They were, standards were put on them that it was, uh, that was impossible for them to follow. You had groups that came up, groups like the Pharisees, the Sadducees, all that were non-existent during the time of Moses. So when this lawyer, this religious lawyer came to approach Jesus, you must understand he was obsessed with the law. He was among the Pharisees. They knew the law. In fact, they created the law. And when he was asking Jesus this question, this question was loaded. Jesus could say so many things that could contradict one of their many laws and and could get himself in trouble. But Jesus' answer is powerful and very deep. He says, these two commands are the greatest. And he says that if we get these two right, we pretty much won't have to worry about all the other commandments because if you walk in obedience to these two laws, all the other laws will be indirectly fulfilled in the fulfillment of these two commandments. And he says, on these two hang all the laws and the prophets. Love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. That sounds easy enough. Love God. Love people. It's easy. You know, loving God is easy. If I ask you all, do you love God? Everybody says, yeah, I love God. I love God. That's easy. So I won't uh, go into that part. But the loving my neighbor part is a little unclear because, you know, who's my neighbor? Do I only love Shashi and Prema because they are my neighbors? You know, um, and, and of course, when Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself, we see in Luke chapter 10, 29, the Pharisee actually goes on to ask him, Lord, who is my neighbor? Which is the question I ask. Who is my neighbor? And then Jesus shares the story of the Good Samaritan. And you know that story, uh, a man uh, gets hit by robbers and he's lying uh, uh, by the side of the road. And, and, and it, Jesus specifically says that this man is naked. He's not wearing any clothes. Uh, he's robbed of everything. And, and that is very significant because you cannot identify who this man is, what, what caste he belonged to. Was he a Jew? Was he a religious person? Was he a Samaritan? So it doesn't matter who he belongs. So they, no one knew who this man was. A name wasn't mentioned. It's just a man who was attacked by robbers. So he, what, one of the things he was saying is it doesn't matter who that person is. It doesn't matter who they, what group they belong to, whether they're part of your people and all that. Then he talks about how the different people walk past him and, then, uh, some, uh, and they, they walk the other side, the religious people, the Jewish people. And finally, the Samaritan comes and the Samaritan are the people that are hated by the Jews. They come and they, uh, and uh, this Samaritan comes and he helps this guy. And Jesus actually ends the story with a question back to this Pharisee, to this lawyer. He, the Pharisee asked him, Lord, who is my neighbor? Jesus shares the story. And then he questions the guy back. He ends with this question, who was being a neighbor to that person? So the question from the Pharisee focused on the other guy, on that person. Is he qualified? Is he, does he fall into the category of the people that I should help? Puts the burden on that person. Jesus shares the story of the Good Samaritan, and he, he brings the focus back to the one asking the question. Being a neighbor isn't about who that person is. It's about who you are. It isn't about who was is my neighbor, it was who was being or behaving like a neighbor to that person. Love your neighbor as yourself. Anyway, the two very important words I want to point out today are the words in the scripture, love your neighbor as yourself. As yourself. Love that person like how you love you. This statement is actually pretty profound when you think about it because what it is also saying is how you love yourself is going to affect how you love others. How you view yourself will have an impact on how you view others. Your self-image is going to be affected by how you 
view, uh, your self-image will affect how you treat others in your world. And that's why we often hear quotes like, you know, hurting people hurt people. You know, because we view the world through our flaws and through our brokenness, and when, when your glasses have cracks on them, everything around you, your world looks, it looks like the world is cracked. Your world is cracked. Everything and everyone in your world look like they have cracks on them. Someone once said it like this, we don't see the world as it is, we see the world as we are. And if I'm commanded to love others as myself, it means now I have to see myself right first. I have to love myself rightly first before I love others. If, not, if I don't love myself right, I'm not going to love others right. You see, because if you tell a person who hates himself to love others as himself, it's going to be very difficult. Because what they feel about themselves will quickly become what they feel about that other person. To the person who doesn't think they deserve love and forgiveness, this person is going to struggle giving love and forgiveness to others. To a person who doesn't walk in grace for their lives, it's going to be very hard for that person to be gracious towards other people. To the person that struggles with self-condemnation, the person that struggles with self-condemnation will be quick in condemning others. So the foundation of this second commandment this foundational principle of loving, loving others, is to have a healthy self-love, a healthy self-image. It will only work if you love yourself right, if you see yourself right. Only then you can love others as you love yourself. And I'm not talking about an unhealthy, egoistical, prideful kind of love where you, know, you stand in front of the mirror every day and say, oh, I love you. You've made my day. From the moment I saw you, I couldn't stop thinking about you. I've been dreaming about you all last night. No, it's not. No, that is a, that, that, for, if you have that kind of a self-love, you need treatment. <laughs> we have a program for that. It's called Sozo. It's inner healing. <laughs> the foundation is this, seeing yourself through God's eyes. If you see yourself right, you will see everyone else right. You can only appreciate the worth of others when you appreciate your own worth. You know, we read in the book of John, and uh, we find that John is described over and over again as the disciple that Jesus loves. It says, Peter and the disciple that Jesus loves. Over and over again, five times he, it is mentioned that he's, he's Jesus' beloved. He's the one that, that Jesus loves. And, you know, and when you read that, you think, wow, there's, there's, there were some disciples that Jesus loved extra, you know, extra special to Jesus because there's these other guys like Peter and James and then there's the disciple that Jesus loved. And it's really impressive until you realize that John actually wrote the book. Jesus didn't call him the disciple that I loved. John described himself as the disciple that Jesus loved. It's like me coming here and telling you, you know, I went for lunch with, you know, three of us went for lunch. Shashi Prema and the disciple that Jesus <laughs> loved. No, now you can think that, you know, John Fleur, damn Prasan Fleur la. Arrogant, thinks of himself, constantly describing himself that way. But the reality is, I don't think that was coming from a place of arrogance. John saw himself through Jesus' eyes. His value or perspective of himself was rooted in who he was in God's eyes. And from that revelation, he could constantly refer to himself as the disciple that Jesus loved. Every one of Jesus' followers knew that they were loved that they had the right to that claim. But John seemed to have a revelation of that love. He boldly wore it on his sleeve. Everyone, the disciple, I'm the disciple that Jesus loved. He boasted in God's love for him. Whereas you see the, the contrast, Peter boasted in his love for God. Lord, Jesus, if all these people leave you, I won't leave you. I love you. I'm going to stand by your side. I, I, you know, he boasted in his love for Jesus. John boasted in Jesus' love for him. Finally, at the cross, John was at the cross beside Jesus, and Peter was hiding somewhere, ran away from that whole moment. 
Peter's confidence was in his love for God. And listen, if we put our confidence on how, how much we love God, listen, we're going to fail. Because there'll be days you wake up and you're not, you're not feeling that. You know, when you go through tough times, you'll have up and down. And then you'll feel guilty. You know, I don't feel like I love God now. What's going with me? It's an up and down, up and what's going on with me? Up and down, up and down. But if I place my confidence, if I anchor my self-image in God's love for me, that love never changes. That love is unfailing. That love is unwavering. No matter my, through my good times, through my bad times, when I'm a good boy, when I'm a bad boy, God's love for me is constant, is consistent, and I can constantly look to that and build my whole self-image on His love for me. Amen? You see, only God has the right view of you. He created you. Only He can reveal to you your true value or worth. If you look at the world, your friends, your spouse, you look to popular culture to define you, you will have a distorted view of yourself. You'll find you're constantly unhappy. I'm not tall enough. I'm not short enough. I'm not nice enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not fair enough. My hair is not long enough. I've got no hair. I don't have enough hair at all, you know. And, and there's going to be this constant judgment of yourself. And, and you start to think, you know, if I have that, I will be fulfilled. If I was like that person, I'll be happy. You know, if I could be like Lady Gaga, then, you know, I would be really cool and people will like me and, and people will value me. Then you'll not only be judging yourself, you'll, you'll have a wrong view of yourself, but you'll also start to have a distorted view of other people. It will affect how you view others in your world. Listen, and if that's you, I want to tell you, listen, don't love me the way you love yourself. I can't handle it. I can't handle that. Don't love me like you love yourself. You need to have the right perspective of yourself. You need to have the God perspective of yourself. And uh, today I want to go back to three foundational principles about you. And so that when you have the right view of yourself, uh, you will start to view others in the right way. And then when you love your neighbor as, your, as you love yourself, it wouldn't be toxic to your neighbor. The first thing you need to know is that you are valued. You know, I think every person here is born with value. You have value. Look to the person next to you and say, you've got value. There's value upon your life. God has placed value upon you. If you were not valuable to God, you wouldn't be here. You know, you're precious to God. In Matthew chapter 13, we see a series of uh, parables that Jesus goes through. You know, the farmer scattering the seed and, uh, and the, the, the wheat growing with the weeds and the farmer, how he takes everything out and, you know, he puts them all together and then he separates the, the weeds later and, and the parable of the yeast, the woman who puts the yeast in, into the dough and how it spreads and then there's the, the parable of the fishing net and how the, 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 the fisherman fishes and, 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 and in all this, this, this script, this, this parables, the farmer, the, the woman, the fisherman, it's all referring to God. But somehow, then there's this, this parable, the parable of the hidden treasure and, and the parable of the pearl of great price. Somehow when we read that parable, we kind of change things. In the, we, we, we kind of uh, exchange, uh, exchange positions uh, in that parable. The parable of the hidden treasure in Matthew chapter 13 verse 44 Jesus says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid. And for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has, and he buys that field. Then he goes on to the next verse. He says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking for beautiful pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. And I've heard this preached, like, you know, how we are that merchant and how God is that pearl of great price and how we must, we must give it all to, to have God and all that. But that's not what the parable is saying. We interpret the, the man or the merchant as being us and the treasure being God. But in all these parables in Matthew chapter 13... The farmer, the woman who puts the yeast, the fisherman, all refer to God. And if we follow that pattern, that means the man and the merchant in this parable should also refer to God. And if the 
merchant and the man refers to God, that means that treasure in the field, that pearl of great price, is you. God is saying, you are my treasure. You are my pearl of great price. You are the treasure. You are that pearl that God was willing to give so much, sacrifice it all so that he could redeem you, so that he could have you. You are precious and valuable to God. You have value. Amen? Look to the person next to you and say, you're a pearl of great price. God loves you. You know, I often... uh, I often say this, God loves you as much as he loves Jesus. As much as he loves Jesus. You know, sometimes we think, you know, if I ask someone, does God love you? Yes. Does God love you as much as he loves Jesus? No, I love us. Uh, I mean, he loves me, but of course he loves Jesus more. No, 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 that's not scriptural. That's not scriptural. John chapter 17, verse 22, it says, I have given Jesus, this is Jesus' prayer. I have given them the glory you gave me so that so they may be one as we are one. I am in them and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and you love them as much as you love me. The message version translates it like this, that you sent me and love them in the same way you love me. As much as he loves Jesus, he loves you. In the same way that he loves Jesus, he loves you. How powerful is that truth? He loves you as much as he loves Jesus. Some of us can't believe that. Even as I'm, as I'm saying it right now, some of you are going, no, Allah, Pastor. No way. Lah. Hey, Jesus said that. It's either you believe his word 100% or you don't believe it at all. You know, when you look at a Van Gogh painting or an antique, you know, none of these things in itself have any great value. You know, it's not because, oh, Van Gogh paintings are worth millions because, you know, the paint he used is made out of melted diamond and gold. So, so you know, the paint is very expensive. You take the paint to the pound shop, it will be worth millions of dollars. No, no, no Van Gogh paintings are, are really, really rare and very expensive. People pay millions of dollars for it because, you know what, his canvas is made of unicorn skin. So that's why it's so expensive and, you know, people, no, no, it, it, it's not expensive because of that. When God's paintings are worth millions, not because of what Winston thought of his paintings or what his friends thought of his paintings, but because a collector saw his painting and was willing to pay a great price. The price that was paid for the painting becomes the value, the current value of the painting. The price... When the painting in itself, the wood, the canvas and all, may be worth less than $50. $50. But people are now willing to pay millions for it because they see value in it. And the price they pay is now the price of a Van Gogh painting. Listen, today you may not feel precious or valuable. Or people around you may not think you're special or of any value. But God saw value in you. And he paid a price. His only son, Jesus Christ, he gave so that he could redeem you, so that he can have you. And the price he paid is now your value. And that is why it says that they will know that you love them as much as you love me. Because what was the price that the father paid so that he could have you, so that he could redeem you? His only son. And that is your value right now. You are precious and you are valuable to God. Amen. Amen. He loves you as much as he loves Jesus, not one ounce less. Amen. You are as valuable to God as Jesus is as uh, valuable to his Father. Amen. Amen. You know, the devil's mission is to devalue you. 
He wants to define you by your sins, by your weaknesses, by your failures, by your mistakes. And he might send people into your life to devalue you. They say things about you to to make you feel small, to remind you of your failures. They tell you how worthless you are. Every time you hear that, you need to recognize that's not God. There is a spirit that has worked, that is at work behind that, trying to get you to a place where you stop seeing yourself through the eyes of God. That you stop appreciating the price that there was paid so that God could have you, that you stop knowing the value that you have in God's eyes. Listen, you've got to decide who has the mic in your life, like what we did a couple of weeks ago. Who are you giving the mic to? Who are you believing? Where are you getting your sense of self-worth and value from? Are you getting it from the world, from the enemy, from the devil, or are you getting it from your creator, God himself? Listen, I've got no control over what comes out of other people's mouth, what they say about me, but what I have control over is what I allow into my heart and into my life and into my family and into my future. That's all I have control over. I have control over what I allow to become my reality. The Word of God is the truth. The Word of God says that you are fearfully and wonderfully made, that you were chosen by God, that you were called to the kingdom for such a time as this, that you are more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus, that you were created, you are His masterpiece, created in Christ Jesus for good works that He prepared, that you might walk in long ago, that He knew you even before you were formed in your mother's womb, that He's got plans and a purpose for your life. That's what the Word of God says about you. Amen? We've all made mistakes. We'll all continue to make mistakes in life, but our mistakes don't define us. It doesn't remove or take away from our value in the eyes of God. You know, I'm going to... How much is this word? It's purple. If you, for those of you who can't see from there. What's its value? What's its value now? One hundred. <laughs> What's its value now? What's its value now? Who wants this? <laughs> sit down, sit down, please, please. In Jesus' name. See? No, no, Stephen. Stephen, listen. Stephen just demonstrated God to you. Regardless of what you've gone through, regardless of what people have said, have done to you, how flawed, how bruised you are in your life, regardless of all the mistakes that you've made, regardless of how you've been treated, regardless of what people have declared and spoken over your life, you still have value in the eyes of God. And the father, just like the, just like the prodigal son, he went and he came back like this, As he was walking past, the father still knew the value in his son. And he ran like Stephen ran to the front so that he could grab that son, so that he could love his son, so that he could appreciate his son because the son's value in the eyes of the father is not diminished regardless of what the son had gone through. Amen? Amen. You're not getting the money paid. Amen? You see, to a person who doesn't see the value, this note is something that should be discarded. But to those who know the true value of it, they know that regardless of what this note has been through, its value is not diminished. You still want it because you know its true value regardless of what it looks like on the outside. Amen? You see, the devil will focus on the dirt in your life. The devil will focus on the wounds, on the struggles. The devil will focus on the imperfections. He will cause you to focus on the imperfections. You've been stepped on. Do you think you're worth anything anymore? You've been spat on. Do you think people will want you? 
You've been crumpled, thrown away. That person threw you away. That person didn't appreciate you. Do you think you have any value? That's the, the devil. The devil is a liar. Amen? He will focus on all those things. But God knows your value. That's why he never stops fighting for you. That's why he runs to you. No matter what you've been through, the moment you turn back towards the father, the father comes running, hugs you because he knows your true value. Look to the person next to you and say, I'm valued. I have tremendous value. You don't see it, but I'm valued. God sees it. God knows my value. Amen. Let's give Jesus a clap offering. You know, going back to my starting point, love your neighbor as yourself. What this is saying is, now that you know you have value, I need to know that my neighbor, that person in my world that's constantly being difficult, getting in trouble, no matter how messed up or how difficult that person is, that person is someone of value to God himself. And you need to look beyond the dirt, beyond the labels, beyond all that that person has gone through. You need to look at that person through God's eyes and start treating that person not according to who he thinks he is, not according to who his parents or her parents thinks she is, not according to what the world describes this person as being. You got to start looking at that person through the eyes of God. This is someone of value to God. That child is someone that God gave his son so that God could redeem him. That woman is someone whom God loves. She doesn't know it. She doesn't see it yet. But I need to see her. I need to love my neighbor as myself. Amen. Amen. Another foundational thing you need to know about yourself. What God says about you is that you are righteous. You know, as, as Christians, we all, regard everybody out there, we all have this common desire. We all have this common need. Uh, we all pursue this in some form or the other, and, and that is the pursuit of forgiveness. We all need forgiveness. Every belief system offers you a way to get forgiveness. You do this, you do that, and people are pursuing forgiveness because they know in their spirit that there's something broken about us, there's something about us that's not right. And the Bible describes it. We all have sinned and fallen short of God's glorious standard. Sin came into the world through one man. And we cannot obtain it, we cannot obtain a level of perfection, of righteousness on our own effort. That's why Christianity gives you the concept of grace. But for the grace of God, we can never have right standing with God. We can never obtain righteousness. And, and we all know that But and God's grace manifests itself through Jesus Christ. None of us can earn forgiveness. We receive it as a free gift, the scripture describes. And we know as followers of Jesus, we are not forgiven because of how good we are, but because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. Because we have a lamb. I did a communion uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I shared about the lamb. And how that in the old days, they had to bring a lamb, and the lamb had to be perfect and, and spotless and without blemish, and they had to bring it to the priest, the priest represented God. And, and the priest would inspect the lamb to make sure that the lamb was perfect. And then the priest would say, okay, the lamb is worthy. And, 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 the, and the sinner would put his hands on that lamb. And the righteousness of the lamb for that instant was transferred by faith upon the sinner. And the sins of the sinner was, was transferred unto the lamb. And the lamb goes to face the judgment and the punishment and the sinner walks away free. And the thing is, you know, when, when, they, when the sinner brings the lamb before the priest, the priest doesn't ask the sinner, what did you do last night? What did you do last week? Have you got this right? Have you got that right? He doesn't inspect the sinner, he inspects the lamb. It is not the sinner who is judged, it is the lamb who is judged. Listen, we all have a lamb. So when we stand before God, listen, God has already judged the lamb. Our lamb was judged and found to be worthy. Worthy is the lamb. Worthy is the lamb. Worthy is the lamb. And his righteousness was transferred upon us. And all our sins, all our unworthiness, every mistake that we've done, every sin that we've committed, or every sin that we're going to commit has already been placed on the lamb. And the lamb has already faced the punishment, paid the price, faced the judgment, so that you and I can walk away righteous. Righteousness is a free gift. You cannot earn it. 
The scripture says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. The righteousness of God was in Jesus, and that was transferred to each and every one of us here. Because we have a lamb, and the lamb is worthy. Amen? Amen. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 14. For by one offering, he perfected forever those who are being sanctified. So you have two statuses, two status, statuses, is that a word? Yeah, okay, two statuses. Um, uh, upon you right now, you are perfected forever. And you are being sanctified. You see, righteousness happens the moment you accept Jesus Christ. The moment you trust in that lamb, in the perfection of that lamb. You're instantly made righteous, but at the same time, sanctification is happening. That means our natural life is catching up to our spirit. Our spirit is perfect, our natural life. So we are, we are two conditions. We are perfected forever, but we are also being sanctified. Yeah. Amen. Look at the person next to you and say, I'm perfect forever. I'm perfected forever. Because of what Jesus did, you have been perfected forever. Colossians chapter 1 verse 22, it says, Yet now he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. As a result, he has brought you into his own presence and you are holy and blameless. You are, not you will be, you're going to be. You are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. That is your condition right now. But it can't be. Oh, it's so hard. It's so hard, right? How can I believe that I am holy and blameless? That's like, oh. But God, you don't know me. No, no, God knows you. That is why he sent Jesus. You are holy and blameless as you stand before him right now without a single fault because of what Jesus Christ has done for you at the cross. Look to the person next to you and say, I'm holy and blameless. Without a single fault. Now look to your neighbor and say, you are holy and blameless. Without a single fault. And the next verse is the challenge. But you must continue to believe this truth and stand firmly in it because that is the hard part. You must continue to believe this and stand firmly because many times we struggle with condemnation, we struggle with guilt, we go through all these different emotions. Why? Because we don't firm, stand firmly on this truth. We don't continue to believe it. The problem isn't out there. The problem is in here. Amen? Amen? Where was I? Romans chapter 8, verse 1, it says, Therefore now there is no condemnation to those who belong to Christ Jesus. No condemnation for you. No condemnation. But, but, but no condemnation for you who belong to Christ Jesus. Romans 8, verse 33. I like this one. Who dares accuse us whom God has chosen for his own? No one, for God himself, has given us right standing with himself. Who then will condemn us? No one, for Christ Jesus died for us, was raised to life for us, and is sitting, sitting at the place of honor at God's right hand, pleading or interceding for us. I like how the message says this in our very uh, modern English. It says, who would that tangle with God by messing with one of God's chosen. I mean, who, who's, who are they talking about? Who is God's chosen? Come on, you're not sure. You are God's chosen. Say, I am God's chosen. I am God's chosen. Who would dare tangle with God by messing with one of his chosen? Who would dare even point a finger? The one who died for us, who was raised to life for us, is in the presence of God at this very moment, sticking up for us. Hallelujah. Come on. Are you excited about that? You guys are not excited. Guys, this is the word of God, man. This is powerful. Some of you need to believe this. 
You need to believe this. You came in here with condemnation, with a heavy spirit. You've been, had people pointing the finger at you. Listen, this is for you, man. The one who died for us, who was raised to life for us, is in the presence of God at this very moment, sticking up for us. Do you think anyone is going to be able to drive a wedge between us and Christ's love for us? There is some way. No way. That's right. There is no way. Not trouble, not hard times, not hatred, not hunger, not homelessness, not bullying threats, not backstabbing, not even the worst sins listed in Scripture can come in between you and the love of the Father expressed through Jesus Christ for you. Amen? Amen. No one can bring an accusation against you. No one. It's already settled in the heavens. Nobody can. And if you're feeling accused and you're feeling condemned, listen, it comes from one source, and that's the devil, and you need to recite this scripture every time you come face to face with that voice of condemnation, that voice of guilt. Listen, God said, therefore, now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. Amen. Look to the person on your right side and say, there's no condemnation for you. You. Come on. <laughs> Colossians chapter 2, verse 30. I'm just going to give you some scriptures. Come on, guys. Then God made you alive with Christ. He forgave some of your sins. He forgave the sins you said, the, the sins you committed before you said the sinner's prayer. No. He forgave all our sins. He cancelled the record of charges against us. Took it away, nailing it to the cross. In this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities, shamed them publicly by his victory over them at the cross. It says he cancelled the written charges against you. And it says in this way, he disarmed the enemy. You know, when you disarm someone, when someone comes to attack you with a gun, when you take away their, to disarm them is to remove the weapon from them. So that means that the the code, that the the list of condemnation, the written code against you was the enemy that the devil used to condemn you, to attack you. That was his weapon. That is his only weapon against you and for your life and for your future. You're not good enough. You're a sinner. You're unworthy. God doesn't love you. You're not good enough. You're terrible. You know what you did? He... He, that, that, that was his weapon that he used against you. But he says, he disarmed, he removed the record of charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. Amen? Amen. That means now the devil comes against you and he doesn't have, you know, he opens his diary and says, okay, look, look, Francis, Francis. Hey, Francis, I used to have one whole diary under his name. What happened? <laughs> Why all the pages blank? Why all the pages blank? And Uncle Francis points to the cross because it's been nailed to the cross. Paid for. Paid in full. Holy and blameless as he stands before Geraldine without a single fault. Amen. 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 You are here, the third thing that you need to know, you are here by design. You know, there, there may be accident, accidental pregnancies, but there's no such thing as an accidental child. You are here by design. Before you were formed in your mother's womb, he knew you. He ordained the days before you. The scripture says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, we are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus. You were created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. The word workmanship here is is translated from the Greek word poema from which we get the English word poem or poetry. You are God's poetry in motion. You're God's poem. It's also translated to the English word, masterpiece. Come on, look to the person on your left and say, I'm a masterpiece. 
And this Stella, look to Uncle Krishnan and say, I'm a masterpiece. <laughs> and now tell him, you are my poetry. <laughs> Roses are red, violets are blue. Krishnan is handsome. <laughs> and I love you. <laughs> you are God's poetry, masterpiece. You are his masterpiece. Designed and desired by the master. A masterpiece is a reflection of the master's skill and the master's heart. There's no such thing as a bad masterpiece, an ugly masterpiece, because a masterpiece is a reflection of the master and God is not bad, God is not ugly, God is not evil. Psalms 129, David wrote this, he said, For you formed my inward parts, that inward parts that you don't like about yourself. Listen, God formed it. You covered me in my mother's womb. This is how God made you. He covered you in your mother's womb. And the psalmist says, I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Say to yourself, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. God took his time with you. Sometimes you see oh, some of these, these guys doing their artwork or making these little dolls and they're, they're fearfully doing it because the slightest small thing can go wrong and you could break it. I just picture God forming you like you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, he says. And my soul knows very well. You see, your soul needs to know. Your soul is the faculty of your emotions, your mind, your thoughts, where everything flows up. Your soul needs, your spirit knows. But your soul needs to know. You need to know. This is who you are. You are God's creation. You are God's masterpiece. You are precious. You are special to Him. Amen? Amen. My soul knows very well. He says, my frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth, skillfully, your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. And in your book, they were all written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there was none of them. All the days, everything that you're going through right now, those days God already saw. And He already wrote His perfect will and perfect plan into those days. You may be having a bad day, but listen, God is working it out for your good because He's already weaved His perfect will and His perfect plan into those days, into that season of your life. He's accomplishing something. He's bringing out the beauty of the masterpiece in you. And sometimes, you know, it has to go through certain things for that beauty, you know, the alabaster jar. The woman had to break the alabaster jar so that the, the smell, the scent of, that was contained within could fill the home and could be a blessing to God. It was all written, the day's fashion for me, when yet, as yet there were none of them. How precious are your thoughts of me? Listen, God is thinking about you right now. Precious thoughts. How great is the sum of them? If I should count them, they would be more in number than the sand. Amen. Listen, you need to read this over, and if you have a problem with self-esteem, you need to read this psalm over and over again so that you see yourself the way God sees you. If you believe this, you cannot have low self-esteem. You are God's masterpiece. You're not an accident. You are here today because you were created in Christ Jesus for good works that He prepared beforehand that you should walk in them. You are here by design. You, are, you have a purpose. You are here because you have a purpose. God has got a plan for your life. You have a destiny. The only reason you're still breathing today, you're still alive today is because God is not done with you yet because He's still working in your life, because He's still working on His masterpiece so that you might be a masterpiece that brings glory to your master. Amen? Amen? God's not done with you. Check your neighbor. If he's still alive, that just means that God's not done with him yet. Is your neighbor still alive? God's not done with you yet. Look at them and say, God's not done with you yet. You have a destiny to fulfill. And the scripture says, love your neighbor as yourself. You need to understand, 
If God has got a plan with you, if He's not done with you yet, He's also not done with that person in your life. God is still working. That person is also God's masterpiece. God's got a plan for that person's life as well. He or she was designed by God for a purpose. The same way you were designed by God for a purpose, the same reason you are here, God has a reason and a purpose for that person being here. They may not know it yet. They may not see it yet. That's why you are in their world, so that you can be a reflection of the master to them. So that even as you see yourself right, you will start to see them right and you'll start to channel that truth into their lives that they were created by God. They're God's masterpiece created for good works that He prepared beforehand that they might walk in them. We need to love our neighbors as ourselves. We need to call out God's purposes in people's life. See them through the eyes of God. But we can't do that if we don't see ourselves right. That's why today is foundational. See yourself right. Know that He loves you. Know that you are valued. Understand His grace for your life. And be a channel of that to other people. Come on, let's stand.